Morning, Drum. Thanks for waking up early. Uh, not a problem. I woke up super early this morning, Daryl. It's just <laughs> perfect. Yeah, so we got a few yeah. people. Got a few people in already. Let's give them a couple minutes to to go. And uh, I suggest we start at like two minutes after the hour, not that wait the normal five minute drum delay. <laughs> well, I had to we I have to wait the normal normal five. It's all good. And uh, and you know I can do video anytime. If you want to do any video, just let me know. Perfect. I'm just setting up the uh, keynote. There we go. Okay, folks, for those who are just waiting for the webinar to start, just waiting a couple of minutes, not going to do too much past the top of the hour because Drummond and I have a fair bit of content to go through. We're aiming to start at two minutes after, so 10.02 Eastern, 7.02, sorry, Drum, uh, Pacific, and uh, Lord knows what other time it is in your time zone. Talk soon. Last time round, drum, I had a uh, countdown timer going on on top of my face. I just oh. didn't uh, didn't go through that today. Oh, I like the countdown timer. Uh, I just remembered it. I'm like, next time, next time I'll do that again. Yeah, yeah. Alex Waltz has a nice little timer set up. Oh, good. You just let the He's room. A pro, fill. though, I'm I'm just a beginner. <laughs> yeah and, and that's why you have such a uh, rudimentary camera rig uh there daryl you know well, that's because yeah <laughs> that, that's a covid thing man yeah well i've lived through covid too and i still have the same camera rig but all right just looking to see what the numbers are at not sure if people are trickling in still or not. Yeah, a few more are still coming in. So we got people from all over the planet. That's pretty cool. All right, Drummond, what do you say we, uh, we, we kick things off a little bit here and uh, people can probably catch up and, and, and or they'll get a copy of the recording anyways if they missed the beginning. Sounds good. Perfect. So just a, a quick, um, who are we? I'm, uh, I'm Daryl O'Donnell. I'm, uh, a couple of years ago, I've been around the space for De decentralized identity, SSI for, well, I think before it was a term. Um, but a few years ago, I did something that was atypical. It was very odd for me to do, which is I issued the wallet report. We did that out of frustration. Um, anybody who's read it, it's a long document, 80, 90 pages. But Drummond, who I've known for many, many years, is the author, along with Alec Crookshat, and editor of the Self-Sovereign Identity book. Drummond was kind enough to create a condensed version of the report with me, which comprises chapter nine of that. And Drummond, you want to do a quick introduction for yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, as you can see on the screen, I'm at Evernim. I'm chief trust officer. Uh, I've been working in this decentralized digital identity, digital trust uh, space for 25 years now, actually. Um, on, I've been to every single one of the internet identity workshops. They just had number 33, that's twice a year. So that's that's a lot of those. And uh, I work uh, heavily on the uh, the protocols involved, you know, up and down the, the uh, stack, and then also on the side of uh, governance and governance frameworks. Um, so uh, love this and and it was a joy when we were, when we were writing the Self-Sovereign Identity book, the uh, uh, I just said chapter on digital wallet agents, just put Daryl's name on it and said, Daryl, we just need to condense that great big report. I, I didn't realize how challenging that would be because 85, 90 pages of, uh, it was really dense. Um, but I think it, it, it might be, it, it's one of the best uh, chapters in the book because of all the meat from that, Daryl. 
Well, thank you. And Drum, you may want to throw your video on. I'm not sure if you. No, I, I, I tried a couple times, but it says the host uh, has stopped it. <laughs> Whatever that uh... host is doing, that's that. Uh, yeah. So if the host will let me turn it on, yeah, I, I don't know how I. That. I don't know how to do that. Ah, okay. Well, um, in that <laughs> yeah, case, I, I'm going to have to be this We have uh, Drummond as a, as a permanent face. <laughs> that's just a face. That's fine. Whatever. Info. Yeah, I'm not seeing where where I can change that. So we just have to live with it. It's mostly we're going to be using the deck most of the time anyways. Uh, let me just try one more thing here. Sure. And while, while we do that, I want to give a shout out to Tim Bauma, who's in our audience, who's also uh, a contributor to another one of my favorite chapters in the book about uh, SSI in Canada. And uh, uh, and thanks for the link, uh, uh, Tim. Yes, we're waving at you, too. Uh, and uh, I think Dave Roberts, I'm not sure if he's named in the book, but he's one of the authors there as well. Yeah, so I was going to say, Tim, Tim and Dave, excellent chapter on you know, yep. all the considerations uh, uh, for, you know, going into the uh, trust frameworks in, in Canada and, and, the, and the architecture that they've developed. I can't say enough about, uh, about that. Perfect. Um, so okay. Just, you yeah, did I think it, I Darryl. figured out the video while you were talking there. So good, uh, good feeling. So uh, I can there do we that. Go. Um, so just real quickly go on and I'm, wow, I'm really not sure why that just did that. Apparently, I copied cool. the animation. So we're going to do a quick, quick introduction here to the overall uh, space by Drummond. We're going to talk a little bit about the landscape, kind of where wallets are. This is a kind of a fast, hard-hitting webinar. We're only going to be here for an hour, both Drummond and I. Unfortunately, we might be able to go a few minutes past the top of the hour, but both of us have a pretty hard stop. Um, I've got a board meeting to go to, and Drummond, I think you're you're doing another webinar or something. Oh, actually, the uh, W3C uh, TPAC, their annual meeting, is this week, and the, uh, the the session on verifiable credentials starts immediately after this uh, webinar. So that's where I'm going to be. Right, it definitely needs needs attention. Um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the the uh, kind of good segue there for what where did the wall report get? What did it get wrong? As well as what did it get right? Um, and, and in there is some of the standards work that really does need some attention. But also in that same vein, we're going to talk about, you know, what kind of surprised us uh, since the wallet report has dropped. It's been two and a half years. Um, time has flown by and there's a few things there that uh, um, really kind of surprised. And I guess maybe in hindsight shouldn't be surprising, but we'll see. And then we have a Q&A. And if you have any questions, just keep in mind, uh, fire them in through the chat or use the, uh, the Q&A button and Drummond and I will monitor that. So Drum, do you want to just give a quick, color commentary on the uh, uh, the whole reason why we're doing an update? I know we well, didn't even talk about this in our prep session yesterday, but hey, <laughs> off to you. Sure. Um, uh, I, you know, I imagine everyone on this webinar is aware that the topic of, uh, you know, SSI and uh, decentralized digital identity, de decentralized digital trust infrastructure has grown pretty hot. Um, I like to point out um, that in Gartner's hype cycle that most folks are probably familiar with, every emerging technology they put on the hype cycle, decentralized digital identity is right at the peak right now. In fact, it's just on the other side of the peak as in, oh, you guys are about to head into the trough of disillusionment. And uh, I've been there a few times before. That's a very, uh, it's like, you know, look around for your parachute. Um, I, I feel somewhat differently about um, this space. Um, and, and I'm not saying we're not gonna go through the trust of digital illusionment. I think we are, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, one of the things I appreciate about the wallet report is it's very uh, matter of fact about where we really are and what we really need to get through. Uh, and and Daryl, I think you called it quite well in terms of some of the challenges that were there. Um, what we've seen, uh, even at the time we were writing your chapter in the book based on the wallet report. That was, you know, that was about a year after the report had came out, we were working on the chapter. Already things had moved along. And so the standards are moving at decentralized identifiers, verifiable credentials, uh, the infrastructure, the utilities at layer one, uh, you know, wallets and agents are, are at layer two. These are the four, you know, overall layers of the trust or IP stack that folks sort of widely agree on. 
credentials and credential innovation is really happening massively, but the tie-in and dependency on the wallet is is really coming out. And then the the demand at layer four for, for the applications and digital trust ecosystems, that's what's driving everything. And we're seeing a lot of innovation there that is also putting you know demands on, on the wallet. So um, I, I just think the space has moved fast. And uh, if you were to keep the wallet report up, Daryl, you'd have to practically be a full-time job. Yeah, given anyone who knows me, I, I can't stand writing reports, so that's just not going to happen. But with that said, it is something that we're looking at doing more often is keep these updates going and also perhaps bring in some people who love writing reports that we can guide and stuff because it was I kind of had temper tantrums while I did it. It was I was very childish about it. Um, so we'll just jump into things. Quick outcomes. What we want you to get out of this is to get an understanding of where has the landscape kind of shifted since the wallet report was pushed out, but also get an idea of where changes have ha have are, are either have already happened or beginning to happen. Um, because some of them are, are some interesting forces that are really kind of shifting some things. Now I'm gonna take that one question from Mr. Sean Bohan that says, Daryl should write more reports, great idea. Yeah, I'm just gonna answer that live and no. <laughs> okay, so the wall report started off and one of the things that we discussed with the group that was we were creating this with, um, which ranged from IIW, Re Rebooting Web of Trust to various other venues, as well as the kind of the, the, the team that was um, supporting the effort, is that we weren't going to get into the history of the wallets and the history of wallets has not really changed. It is a long history. That report really covered it off. That's where that animation came from, by the way, Drummond. Mm. <laughs> but it's really mostly carnage. Um, the history from uh, Microsoft Passport through to um, pretty much every major credit card, major bank got into the top of wallet fight about five, 10 years ago. Um, in most of those organizations, wallets or um, uh, I know MasterCard had a master pass. It's, that is a word that shall not be spoken. It, it, there, there are scars from this stuff because tens of millions of dollars, if not hundreds of millions of dollars were spent and nothing came of it really. And or what came of it was just a, a tiny whiff of the, of the potential. But now we're looking and seeing digital wallets that are everywhere, um, ranging from in the SSI space, I would call them the developer-centric generic wallets. These are the ones that you can put multiple credentials, multiple connections. And if you're not a developer, you'd have no idea what you're even looking at. We're seeing these in banking apps uh, embedded into credit card, crypto, um, Apple recently adding uh, MDL, mobile driver's license support, as well as vaccination passport, vac vaccination credentials in the Apple wallet. Um, I'm from Canada and we've got multiple provinces who have issued out both uh, uh, card like wallet apps for our citizens, as well as tools for the verifiers. If I go to see a movie or a restaurant, I still need to use those right now. Actually, not even still need. We're just starting to use them uh, in, 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 in certainly in Ontario where I'm based. Regardless, the history is messy and it's still messy. So this kind of uh, uh, wallet report was written to, to kind of stop the, the hand waving and understand all of the dimensions. And don't, don't pretend that we covered them all but a large number of the dimensions of what we have to think about and just how big the digital wallet space is. So we're gonna go through quickly, just, you know, what did the report get wrong and right? And I'm hoping this report doesn't move. Okay, good, it didn't move yet. <laughs> um, and we'll go through these in more detail, but I just wanted to rip through them really quickly. One is, and Drum and I will do kind of a, to use the term he, he uh, Coin he used yesterday is we're going to use a sports thing with anyone who knows me. I'm not a sports person unless it's like rugby or something. Um, I'm going to do the play by play and he's going to do the color commentary. We'll kind of do that. Anyone who's, you know, worked with us in the past know that uh, Drummond is kind of my work wife. We've spent, I spend more time with Drummond sometimes than I do with my family. So on the agents, we got a fair bit wrong. Um, and we'll explain why because actually we got a fair bit right, but overall, I would say we were wrong. The concept in the report, um, both the both versions of the report, and I'll speak to what that means a little bit later, is that the single purpose wallet apps, we were right on that. Those are out there. And again, we'll get more detail in a moment. Um, the prevalence of cloud and custodial wallets, kind of got that wrong. It was mentioned, um, but not to the level of detail that I think we're, what we're seeing in the wild. 
Um, what I'm now calling premature interoperability and premature standardization, we got right. Um, it wasn't as strong in the report, but uh, we'll speak a little bit to that. And then trust registries, we got very right and very wrong um, in, in many different ways. So we'll jump in on the, on the eight. Oh, there goes that animation. <laughs> and it comes back. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I get for doing a... It's the only time I've ever done a, a did for the for the trust registries webinar, made the thing move. It's the only time I've ever done that. I should have known. The agents, um, the, the the left hand side of this, you're sort of seeing a cut and paste the image of the actual report, which speaks about the various different types of agents, whether that be messaging or a health agent or home security or a buying a data use consent agent. None of these things exist. The Agents that exist are really um, quite crude. Some are very important. One, for example, is recent, very recent work on the mediator agent. Everybody else, the mediator is simply the cloud agent that lets you know, how do you talk to my phone? How does it talk to that? Up until these mediator agents came out, these were very vendor specific. Um, that's great. It's basically store and forward messaging agent. That's not really where we are looking at in the report on agents. Drum, any idea why you think that is that we, we haven't hit the ground running on building real purposeful agents as opposed to infrastructure level? Um, I'll give you two reasons. One is uh, not surprising. You got to build bottom up, right? It's hard to build the functionality. Um, I mean, we're going to talk about special purpose wallets, and and uh, I, I I would actually argue that some of the some of the special purpose wallets are taking functionality that will eventually be in agents, but they're just doing it as a dedicated app, and it's going to move into the agent. The other reason I think is also uh, pretty straightforward, which is um, we need it. We need to have the agent agent communications protocol uh, established. And the good news is, as you know, Didcom V2 is right around the corner. Um, we saw demonstrations at IW, and um, I, I personally believe Didcom is going to be the universal uh, agent to agent. In fact, that's what it was originally called. And then when it was, became clear it was going to be did to did, that's where the term Didcom came from. So I think as soon as that comes out, we'll start seeing uh, that function move up. But you're right. It's, right now, it's just mediators. Yeah. So we'll talk a little bit more about this, Drum. I think part of it is we've, part of it is to your point, it's infrastructure. It's the basic Lego blocks that we need to build upon. I think we've also been somewhat distracted by that premature interoperability, which is its own topic, which we'll get into just a minute. Um, I would also say, and this is, uh, by the way, a bullet point I added after we spoke, but I'd also say that some of this comes down to the, the approach that the, the our community has taken, and I'm as guilty as any, of the technical purity of the SSI side. We have been pushing the destination of, you know, Sovereign has its uh, principles of SSI, the Sovereign principles of SSI, that all of them must be met at once. And it's really, really hard. I think the solutions that are out there right now have been um, going in eyes wide open and the ones that are working, meaning they have functioning agents at least and functioning tooling, are allowing and waiting for the full principles to be going and to be you know, more pure later when necessary, as opposed to us looking at the real business problems that we're trying to solve. What is the actual problem we're trying to solve and how do we bring SSI decentralized identity to bear upon those problems? And we'll speak to a couple, actually it's really one example that comes up in a couple places um, as we go to the next slides, I think. There we go. So one of the predictions in the report was that single purpose apps, so a wallet that you may not even realize is a wallet, um, became, sorry, my Zoom is now deciding to jump all over the screen for some reason, perfect. Um, you may have an app that has an SSI wallet and you have no idea. You have no clue that there's a, a, a DIDCOM connection in there and there's one or more or zero or more um, credentials that are being used to do certain things. We've seen banking apps um, in the credit union space where they have an SSI wallet that's absolutely silent to the member. What they've done is they have a DIDCOM connection. They have a credential that is silently checked after you onboarded to make sure that it really is you because they are experiencing really unbelievable levels of mobile banking fraud. 
Um, a good example of this might be uh, a digital identity credential for a company. This is to sign in to, to things inside of a company. eStatus has been doing this internally. Other groups have been doing this with more, I would say, broader uh, uh, business. Um, we're also seeing some governments right now. There's about eight or nine, maybe 10 governments right now that are creating kind of, you call them a wallet app, but really it's more of a digital identity app from the government um, because they're learning to explore the space and really doing a single purpose application is the only way they can really look at it. Um, before I jump into Bonafide Member Pass, Drum, any thoughts on the why single purpose versus generic? Whoops, has has jumped ahead. Um, no, I I really do uh, agree. Um, I think again, <clears throat> ironically, it is the solve a business problem, solve a specific problem. Um, the fastest way to do that is with a specific app. And yes, it's got wallet functionality. It's, it's, it's going to head in the direction of SSI decentralized identity, but I don't, it doesn't, doesn't really surprise me. Um, I often bring up Daryl, you know, the example of when, when the web first started, um, uh, you know, companies and, and folks that said, Oh, wow, we're going to start using a website. They all thought they needed their own browser. Right. Yeah. And then it began to become clear, oh, no, you actually want it to be generic function. I think we're going to go through the same kind of curve. It'll start to become clear. Oh, you're issuing credentials and you're issuing credentials, you're issuing credentials. You're not going to want a separate app all the time for, for that. You actually want, in my opinion, you're going to want both. You want credentials to work on specific apps and you want generic wallets and they're going to they're going to work together. Yeah. And I think it's actually good. that's kind of a good unplanned uh, segue into the next sort of single purpose app, which I want to bring up, which is uh, Bonify, a, a, a former client of, of our of mine, produced member pass. And the last thing I said, I said, the last thing you want to do is build your own wallet. However, you need to build your own wallet because in the long term, this is going to become uh, something that, that the developers consume, whether it be sitting in the Android and iOS stack itself, or there is some generic wallet capability that one can consume. And we'll speak a little bit about how, how some groups are actually doing that right now, building some real heavy infrastructure. But the Bonafide Member Pass side really is a dead simple application. It um, establishes a DIDCOM connection and it issues a Member Pass credential. What's interesting is the learning that had been over creating this, and this is something we deployed operationally. I was the, the contract CTO. I think we deployed it operationally in January, 2020. Um, it had been working before that, but now there's about 20 credit unions who are using this system. Um, turns out the credential wasn't as important. And this is something that I think the space is missing a little bit is everyone talks about credential, 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 because what we're actually using this is an example, but every credit union has their own logo for real, is almost is asking almost as exact, sorry, the exact same question. Hey, are you on the phone with the call center from Happy Members Credit Union or Unify Financial Credit Union? Are you standing at the branch? Are you in the branch at Long and Main? Yes or no? They're asking this question because that is the fraud attack vector, and they don't need the credential for that because the DIDCOM channel is by definition authenticated and there are messaging protocols that allow you to exchange a simple question with yes, no. You get back a digitally cryptographically signed version of what the question was and how I answered it. And this has really changed a couple of things. One of the biggest learnings that happened there was, um, and keep in mind that we're in, in, in many ways SSI zealots Moving towards this, Member Pass and CU Ledger, the company behind which is now Bonify, is one of the original supporters of Sovereign and invested heavily in the space, knew that there were two things happening here. One, that the credit union was on one side and the member was on the other, and that they were peers. Yet, we ended up falling into our own trap because we're selling to the credit unions the feature that you'll really know it's your member. And, and, and that's important, absolutely critical. That's the fraud attack vector. But what we missed on a survey, and I've probably, probably heard me say this before, folks, you get the surveys, eight, you know, pick from one through four, ABC, rank from nine to 10. At the end of every survey, there's this obligatory question that never generates a signal. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, this is the only case I saw where it, that signal was better than the whole survey. And it basically, everybody said something to the following. As a member, 
I can't tell you how happy I am to know it's really the credit union. We've forgotten the two-way part of this of this equation. That's Didcom. That to me is the what the single purpose apps are proving to us. But to Drummond, to your point, we started all, all of us started with generic developer apps, moved to the single purpose, and we're going to move over time back to generic. Question comes when? And I, I don't have an answer on that. Things are moving slower on, on some of the fronts. Well, I just want to actually double down on your last point there, Daryl, on that slide. Um, and uh, I'll just say, I've been saying for a while that uh, the big the big win in SSI, you know, credentials are fantastic, but it's the connections. It's the Didcom uh, messaging, the, you know, uh, private um, uh, uh, a personal channel is, is, you know, what I call when you're talking about individuals, of course, it's, it's a private business channel when it's uh, business to business or, or with a, with a thing, but, you know, a simple way to put it is uh, back when and some of us are old enough to remember, right. Email was a killer app of the internet, right. That's what I, I think did come to killer app of what we now call SSI decentralized digital identity and and the wallets and agents are necessary to have those didcom uh, connections that's what you're doing it's it's wallet to wallet it's did to did communications um, I just you know a year from now Daryl will do this podcast and it'll be the didcom uh, uh, right because yeah. I totally and and so the fact that um, with with member pass it turned out to be the authenticated connection I really think that reinforces um, the credentials will get more and more important. And your, your point about, well, you actually need both parties, right? Today, we don't have that on the web, right? We, we find yeah. out there's a lock in the browser if there's a certificate on that server, but you know, it's a very asymmetric relationship. When we both have credentials and we can exchange in both direction, I mean, phishing is gonna be a thing of the past. Yeah, it's gonna be almost comical. It, like really, you, you think you're my bank, okay. Um, I'm just going to run through a couple quick questions here that relate. Uh, Karen, yeah, you, you, she raised, uh, you know, it seems single purpose are effective within verticals. Totally. That's where the single purpose apps really, really shine. Um, when you get into more generic ones where you have ecosystems talking to each other, that's where we're going to get into the, huh, my vertical app doesn't fit here anymore. We need to go a little more general. Um, I'm just going to mention we're getting to, to folks. We're getting some great questions in the Q and A, uh, and you know I think we'll have plenty of time to get to them. Uh, don't don't think we're not paying attention. Uh, yeah. It's just <laughs> we're, I knew there were going to be a ton of great questions. Yep. Yeah, I think we'll dive into the a few of these 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 these. <laughs> yeah, some of these questions are going to be a little, probably a little harder to answer, but I'm, I'm looking, I, I have, I think we can start answering all of them, but I'd like to, if you don't mind drumming, sure. uh, run through yeah. where we are, because I think we might cover off some of them, but they get into the nitty gritty, especially on the, uh, the, the single purpose and the crypto stuff on the wallet apps. So cloud custodial wallets is an area that we kind of didn't really see coming to the same level as which they, they, they happened. Um, this being that customers are requesting kind of a, a no app option. They want to have a cloud or a custodial wallet where someone is taking care of this. Um, I actually met with a, with a relatively large uh, identity organization yesterday and actually used this exact slide that we created while we talk, talked yesterday, Drummond. The um, problems I see behind this, one is as simple as great. That's, that's fantastic. You're improving the situation. It gets difficult quickly because you can't get the same level of assurance and security when you're sitting with a cloud custodial wallet for a couple of reasons. One is it's hard to prove it's actually me accessing that, that wallet. And you may fall right back down to username and password. Someone may say, and I heard someone say, well, it's instead it's a pin and a passcode. I'm like, really? So it's two <laughs> passwords? Okay, great. That's wildly different than that. Um, yeah. <laughs> the realization was, yeah, maybe that's not any better. Um, this is an area where I don't have a problem compromising on some of the SSI principles, because if you're heading in the right direction, you can't be perfect. And I would argue we're not certain that, you know, 10 years from now that we well, we may look back and say, we didn't quite, quite have the principles nailed, but we're heading in the right direction. 
but I'm finding that some of them are, and this answers one of the questions of, uh, uh, that's in there is uh, about SSI is where's the line between addressing current business needs and being misleading, meaning if someone says we're SSI based, it's like, yeah, to use a technical phrase, uh, horseshit. Um, <laughs> you're, you're a scammer, basically. This is where things get a little bit funky. Part of the question would be, well, who's in charge of that cloud? Is it, is it the vendor who's in my relationship? Or is it really a third party that we both kind of trust? Um, the Wall Report spoke to, for example, I actually, when it comes to digital assets that exist only in my wallet, as opposed to those that are on chain and recoverable, I actually want someone involved in my life, whether that be an insurance company, a telco, a bank, a specialized provider who's going to do that backup and make sure that it's really secure to recover my backup so that doesn't become my attack vector. I have no problem with third parties being involved when they're adding value. The question in my mind is when you're leaving the power on the side of the vendor, it becomes a little bit tougher on that one. Drama, any thoughts on that? Oh, man, I have a ton of thoughts on this, but I'll keep it really short. Um, I and I'm glad you brought up that last bullet. Um, we have seen, you know, market evidence, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, Daryl, when we were talking, Evernim put our initial uh, work and still our major focus has been edge wallets, right? Wallets on your local device, your your smartphone, um, um, because uh, it we're, it's implementing one of the key design principles we're, we're finishing uh, in, in, in a paper for uh, uh, the Trust RP Foundation, keys at the edge, right? That's the safest place to have your keys. Now, given that there are many, what we're seeing is many, many cases, and, and, and the, I divide them into two groups. One is transitional. The other one is they just simply don't have the option. They, they don't have the connection. They don't have the device. They are yeah. displaced populations. They're just, there's, you know, and I, I'd say that's gonna be maybe as much as a quarter or a third of humanity is still gonna be in a position for our lifetimes of not being able to have that. They're gonna need those cloud and custodial wallets. Um, yeah. and, and so we're seeing more and more demand for that. We have it on our roadmap to add more robust uh, support for that. The second key point I'll make is, the way to think about this that will be, in my opinion, and I've, I've had this for a long time and I'm feeling more and more strongly about it all the time, it will be uh, compatible with the principles of SSI. The security issues we're gonna have to work through, but yep. the way to make it compatible, one word, fiduciary, right? That cloud wallet or custodial wallet provider has to be in the same kind of fiduciary position that your bank or your credit union uh, is in in terms of, of serving as your, you know, talk about agent, your ultimate agent in terms of giving you control of that, ensuring you have control. And the real test will be that final bullet, portability. Uh, can you move from one, um, you know, custodial or cloud wallet provider to another one? And of course, can you always have the choice of moving it to your uh, local device, right? The refugee that finally, you know, moves to a new uh, situation, can they take all those credentials, all those DIDs that they've established relationships and then finally move them into their own uh, devices and, 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 and not have to uh, depend on that. So anyway, that's enough said on that one. Yeah, well, actually you, that, that point you raised, uh, the, the fiduciary and the, and the dovetails into one of the questions that Timo has asked is, he's wondering what, a, what your thoughts are when it takes a generic wallet to really take off. Does it need to be an OS level thing? meaning built into iOS and Android? Or is there another way, another vendor that we can pull this off without requiring and or capitulating to, um, that's my phrase, <laughs> not, not Timo's, um, to Apple and Google? I think the cloud actually lets us start to ask the question, where does my stuff need to be? Because here's the business problem. If I ask you for right now a COVID credential and identity, Right now, those are two distinct applications and neither can answer both questions. So now we have this really screwy and just, it's just to my mind, it's a dead duck. We can't do it of, oh, let me pull out my driver's license app and show it to you. And you've got a passport app and, and I've got, oh, and I've got a vaccine app and I got a piece of paper. You can drum has got a piece of paper. It's useless. But if our phones could basically say, yep, I'm in control of that. And I'm going to make sure that one, there's a biometric tie that I know that this is Daryl as opposed to someone else. 
and it may reach to the cloud and come back. There might be a local cache if you're offline, that type of stuff. There's probably an intermediate step where we have the cloud and it may stay there or the operating system vendors have to come in. John Jordan did a really good, I don't have the slide handy, but a really good uh, deep thinking with uh, another gentleman out in BC, Peter Watkins, that we need to be able to do, do two things. Our devices must be able to respond with attributes or claims from one or more credentials, which means you need a single service responding on your device, otherwise you get this terrible UX. But then he gets into the, what does that mean um, for confidentiality uh, and, and privacy? The second piece being is that when he used the analogy of going to the doctor's office. So two things fall out of that. One is that the communication, the existence of the communications should not require a third party unless we agree. So if I go to the doctor's office, I don't need to tell you that. If I decide to tell you that and decide might mean, hey, I'm sending $10,000 to Drummond, that's private. $10,001, I'm going to break the law. If I don't have a third party involved, that's my choice. I could break the law, probably shouldn't. The second piece there is that no one knows the contents of what we discussed. So if I went to the doctors, you didn't know about it. But even if I did tell you I went to the doctors, it's none of your business what, what we discussed, unless I decide, again, for whatever rule reasons, the details of what that is. So the money, the money analogy maybe has to be the amount of money and source of funds and, and was KYC AML done. So that might help on, on, on Timo's side. So here's one where I got ranted on at IIW is what I call premature interoperability and premature standardization. Um, my view is that we're still in the very earliest of stages. If I take one standard that everyone says right now, yep, we're compatible with the W3C verifiable credentials spec. Went great. There's at least four variants there and I, there is no conformance test so when you tell me that as an architect or business type, I don't even know what you're saying. All I know is you're, you're saying you're part of the standard, but it is of very low utility for me. We need to get to the point where those standards are much more predictable. We understand the privacy impacts, for example, on the W3C verifiable credentials spec, but even the spec itself says, hey, great, here's this, this, this thing, wow. <laughs> It's a mini DV tape. I don't even know why I have it on my desk. I can tell you the exact format of what this is and stuff like that. But if you don't, this is a really great actually analogy. I don't have the camera for it anymore. I don't know how to put it in the camera. I don't know how to take it out. I don't know how to press play. Same thing goes for the credential. Here's an old bank card of mine. I can hand you that. If I don't know how, how to offer it to you, if you don't know how to ask it from me, if you don't know how to offer it to me, the format of this is absolutely, utterly irrelevant. So I think we're great. We're starting on that. But people have prematurely jumped in on the standard side, thinking it's solving the problems, and it's not. So what ends up happening is this concept of interoperability is elusive and ill-defined. Ill, uh, and it causes business confusion, which again goes back to the single purpose app. Just get your own stuff working. Get your own ecosystem working, but head towards where things are. So what's happening right now um, is many organizations. Drummond, uh, I should have brought up, and it occurred to me as we went through the single purpose app, I should have brought up the IATA use cases where someone is picking a stack and I'll jump in and introduce IATA and then I, if you could speak to it. Sure. Because I want to be the one introducing it saying, IATA and its partners said, we're picking the Evernim stack to meet our business needs. Can you explain why they did that drum and, and what they're getting out of it? Uh, I think the short answer is um, it's a, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, a stack. It is based on, you know, Hyperledger Indy, the Aries uh, protocols. I think the single most important thing in their decision was that it, it fully uh, implements um, uh, a non-creds, zero, zero knowledge proof credentials and uh, that give um, the, uh, you know, it's fully, fully decentralized and give uh, passengers complete control over their digital wallets. They needed to meet the highest, you know, their international airline association, they have to meet the highest privacy standards in the world for all the airlines. Uh, and so they, you know, it's one of those unusual cases where the business driver was to actually be, you know, call it full SSI 
um, and and they remain, you know, steadfastly. Uh, that's that's what their requirements are. So I'll I'll be the play devil's advocate a little bit. They are still picking a vendor, and they're tied to Evernet. Let's not kid ourselves. But what's really cool about it is those IATA travel passes have a very short life. So as the standards and in interrupt become more clear, you can transition away. And, and I would never know that, hey, two, two, two years ago, I used an IATA travel pass. Wouldn't work anywhere else, but now they work everywhere. So you can actually baby step this along as opposed to something that's really, really long lived, like a driver's license. That I wanna make sure is under control, which actually, well, that's kind of a nice segue again. It's like I planned this, Drummond. Um, we're seeing governments around the globe right now pick stacks. They're typically picking open source stack. Um, so specifically, we're seeing, I don't know how many governments right now. Um, there are governments in Canada, Germany, Finland, Netherlands, Spain, using picking different stacks. The most common one right now is Hyperledger Aries, Hyperledger Indy. The reason for that is, that to, in my view at least, is a couple of things. Nations are exerting their own digital sovereignty. They've recognized quickly that the big tech companies, um, one, are now geopolitical players. I was tweeting out about Ian Bremmer has a beautiful article in Foreign Affairs on what that means and what it could become. But countries, whether that be at the national level or, or, or regional level, are realizing that they need to get control of this for their citizens for their own purposes. So what they're doing is standardizing on a very limited set of use cases, very limited set of things that they're issuing to you. Um, we've seen driver's licenses come out. Um, we've seen uh, new identity cards come out. Hey, here's your photo, age of majority. That's a term we use. You know, can I can I buy can I buy booze type of thing, um, as well as an address. Very simple credential, useful in many different contexts. Not extremely high assurance, meaning that no one's going to die because I used it. No one's going to collapse a business because I used it, but it can start to make my life easier. More important, we can learn what those real interactions are at the points of engagement, that that's where the interoperability is absolutely crucial. So we're seeing that that pattern happen. And to me, this pattern of picking a stack, whether that be IATA saying we're going commercial on this and knowing they have a way out. Like I've always said, and, and, and I've been a, a, a thorn in the side of Evernim at times, um, for my clients, and then I, my statement has always been, I must be able to remove you as a partner. It can't be open heart surgery and risky, and, but it also can't be just like taking a bandaid off. This is, we're, we're in bed together, we're doing something, but I cannot have you hold my business, my client's business um, in danger. You're a partner because you're the best partner you can be. Let's work on that. The minute it becomes, I need to, to divorce you, well, now we're in a whole different conversation. But what I'm really liking to see is this alignment is starting to happen, and it's happening on a couple other fronts. One of which is the agent-agent discussion, which became Hyperledger Aries, um, and part of DIDCOM. It kind of forked off into what are we doing, messaging families. It also a diff, so diff is DIDCOM. It also has this thing, wacky pecs. Uh, web and credential interface presentation exchange. Exactly. You got it. So, so some people love the name. I think it needs some marketing people behind it. Regardless, what's really cool is we have two different groups. Hyperledger Aries Managed at Hyperledger aligns really, really well with Trust Over IP Foundation, which Drummond and I are both founders of. Um, aligns really, really well with Wacky Pex because we're getting to the point of, hey, I need to show you this credential. Here you go. You need to request a credential. Here you go. We're starting to answer the right questions. And that's where the interoperability and standardization is going to happen, I think. <laughs> Next one, the last one, I think it is, Drum, is the trust registries, which I thought I had been so critically, you know, this is absolutely totally required. The Wall Report talked about it, but I forgot that parts of it were private. There were two reports. Those who have read the Wall Report, Lots of people have, and thank you for the feedback. Again, I'm not writing another one. There were actually two. The sponsors, the folks that worked with me on that, and we threw in a bunch of money and time, and they threw money and time in, received a private report that was aimed specifically at what does this all mean to you? The trust registry was mentioned in, in the, in the uh, public wall report, 
but the context and why it mattered on a business level was mentioned in much more detail in the private report. But in essence, let's cover off and drum. Do you want to run through the quick trust triangle here, or do you want me to run through it? I uh, you go ahead. This is yeah, cool. I think yeah. Go ahead. Perfect. So the the whole concept. Anybody in SSI probably has seen this too many times. But I'm going to show you where something something falls down a little bit. So as an issuer, I issue a variable credential, a driver's license to a holder. Okay. So Drummond, you've got a driver's license that I've issued to you. Later, a verifier is going to say, hey, Drummond, I need, to, uh, I need to see your driver's license, makes a request for a proof, gets that and says, cool, I trust the issuer, but do you? And this is the Sankarshan, I don't think is on the call, but he's, he would be here waiting for me to say, turns out I'm a high school student from New Brunswick who is selling fake driver's licenses on the internet for $20 a piece. You have no idea that this public did is anchored to a real institution? Or is it this high school kid who's issuing this out? So how do we know, how does the verifier know the issuer is authoritative? And in the good health pass work we did at the beginning of the year, we got to start answering another question is, should I give this private information? Because right now the vaccine information, it really is in many ways, private health information. Should I give this information to the verifier are they trusted to, to see and consume this? This becomes more and more important to use that same driver's license analogy. And this one gets beaten up too much in the SSI space. How do I know I should give my full driver's license to someone at a bar? Because they should be asking for an age majority. Are you old enough to drink? If they ask for the full, I might want to say, hey, no, you're not a law enforcement person. You're not a government official. I'm actually going to report you to my ecosystem privacy folks. So here's what we realized that in Drummond, I think Drummond, you and Charlie, Charlie from uh, MasterCard at the time, um, realized it's really a trust diamond because there needs to be a governance authority that is managing the issuers, managing the verifiers, potentially, which alludes to a question of man who asked about the cryptographic health of a remote wallet, potentially managing the holders and the wallets. They may actually need to do this. And they do this by publishing a governance framework. And here's the hint. That governance framework is absolutely critical. It tells you, you know, one, where do I get the list of the DIDs? Or later down the road, where do I get the list of, of how do I know what the credential looks like that the governance authority says, you are a bona fide issuer, you can trust this to some extent. Um, I kind of jumped through this one and now I've got a bad slide. Um, we're running out of time, Drum, and how about I, wow, well, we got lots of questions too. I'm going to burn through this one, but just part of the question, we did this in member pass over two years ago, which is why I'm disappointed that the, the report didn't raise the importance of a trust urgency so much. We answered the question, you know, a credit union issues a member, a member pass credential is presented to typically another credit union or actually most commonly their own credit union. So this one's really easy. Does the did match? That's they, they know that. But now they're starting to answer the question because they do shared branching is I can walk from Unify Financial into a desert financial credit union and take money out of my Unify account. Um, they want to know, was that really a Unify credential? That's why we built out what's called the Member Pass Trust Registry, which is the public dids are listed. There's an allow list that says, here's this. And by the way, here's who it is. And if you need to get into their um, NCUA file on their credit, their national cre credit union registration, you can do so. And that one's anchored down to sovereign. I think the next slide, uh, Drum, really is Q&A. And we got a lot. <laughs> what do you a think? A lot. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's, uh, um, I, I just, relative to trust registries, I want to point out to folks, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll put the link in the uh, in the chat, uh, Daryl and I uh, co-chaired, uh, coming out of the Good Health Pass work, uh, Trust Strategy Task Force at Trust Over IP, and, uh, and produced, uh, we were aiming for, you know, 45 days, it took us closer to 90, but we have a trust registry um, uh, protocol um, uh, spec that is in uh, review right now. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, it's like V1 lowest common denominator, but, you know, should uh, take care of both those basic use cases uh, that Daryl was talking about. And we see, you know, a lot of evolution there. Um, I know there's probably someone on uh, the, the call that's going to say, well, what about just chaining credentials? And we're like, yep, you can do that too. Both are paths to the same end result. And as Daryl says, we just need to build up 
you know, not prematurely go too far, but get the working solutions in place and, uh, and we'll work it out. Tons of great questions there. I don't know how you want to jump through. Well, them. I think Karen, I think has asked a really good question here is, you know, how do you allow for an appointed governance authority to manage uh, things? But I'm going to kind of twist the question around a little bit, Karen, hopefully I'll answer it. You know, for a credential can bring value in aggregate, but also provide benefit for a single person. Like, um, I'm not even sure if this will answer the question, but but think about the concept of issuing a digital driver's license or the physical one. Okay. Interestingly enough, I received a new driver's license last night. This is expired. The government right now, this is from I live in Ontario. The government right now um, is considering down the path, they've announced this, that they're going to be issuing digital versions of these things. But what does it mean? And what does it mean in liability terms and stuff? Well, right now, I've been using my driver's license around the world. Um, with various rental car agencies, no formal agreement and no liability exists between Hertz in uh, uh, Utah and the province of Ontario. Zero connection, but it's utility unto itself. I'm carrying a what's known as a driver's license. What's also interesting about this one is it's expired. I could still use this to get into a bar if someone was ever, you know, I'm guessing it's a policy choice if they're asking me for, for if I'm old enough to drink or not. Um, there's lots of different utilities there in the governance authorities, which if they keep it nice and simple, we can start to do um, a lot with these credentials with very light governance on top of these types of things. I'm not sure, Karen, if that answered your question, I'm hoping it kind of does. Drummond, any questions you wanted to dive in on? Oh, there's some, um, uh, Manu has asked uh, twice different questions about, I like the succinctness. How can one attest the cryptographic health of a remote wallet? Um, and yeah. earlier on, um, you know, for multi-purpose wallets, how do you get cryptographic attestation, attestation of the cryptographic health of the wallet? Uh, uh, no one should be relying on a, a third-party unmanaged wallet of unknown cryptographic quality. Two things I want to say about that one. The first one is, yes, we definitely need governance frameworks uh, that establish privacy and security requirements for wallets that are certified, in which case, the wallet is actually, you know, the wallet is a, um, a thing from which you can request a credential. Um, so that's, that's point one. Uh, that sort of gets to the point of, well, how, how far down will it go? Will the wallet be, you know, we're sort of, we're at the app stage, then we got the browser stage and we got the OS stage. I do believe eventually you're gonna move down uh, to the OS. I don't know exactly how long it will take. But I think those, those attestations will get stronger and stronger as you move down. Um, I think we need also, I would also add on, the, on that, how do you trust the wallet question? You also need to know, you know what are we trusting? Um, one of the learnings we had, uh, Drummond, when I was you know, CTO for CEO Ledger Bonify, um, we were using Connect Me in a variant, a white labeled version of Connect Me. And it has a capability of doing a backup and recovery which seems totally normal until you realize a credit union or bank is like, well, hang on a second. You can move phones without me knowing? Now, whether that's a valid question or not, it leads, needs some discussion. But the business case is they're trying to solve, which is a major fraud vector, which is called family fraud, where I take mom's phone, back it up, either I've, and, and, and I restore it, and she has no idea that I'm approving transactions on my phone not hers. So there's this whole thing, can I move things in between? Um, I'm working with the government right now that that is one of the flags we need to set is the, it works on this device only. And the analogy there is, hey, it's the same as if I, if I lose my physical wallet or if I buy a new wallet, I may have to do a painful process. I mean, buying a new wallet's a little different, but if I lose it, I have to go and get the credentials again. We'll get better in that, but those rules of the road is where the governance becomes important is, am I allowed to move my credential around, yes or no? And if I am, into which wallets? In the report, we jokingly, and I've used this a lot, is, you know, do I trust Bubba's wallet? Best user experience. We've been told it's really, really secure, but every time it does something, this kind of alludes to another leakage, Timo, on your leakage question, every time I do something, it sends information to North Korea. Probably not a good idea to use Bubba's wallet. And I'd like to know how that gets... Um, how do we test the conformance? How do we set the conformance criteria? How do we accredit that conformance criteria? 
which on the high security side, the high assurance credentials, we're going to end up with a small limited list, I think, of wallet providers because it's hard. And those yep. high assurance credentials, no one's going to make money making that wallet. They're going to make money on the fact what it enables. That wallet is going to be really hard to build. Well, the other other key point here is that, uh, as I like to put it, there, there are two things you, um, as a verifier, the higher assurance you need, there are two things you need to know. You need to know the wallet's secure. Although I want to point out something is a lot of folks focus on wallet security without realizing that credentials are digitally signed and passed through the wallet, okay? So, um, you know, I'm not saying wallet security is not important. You have to control your dids and your, and your keys, but you can't compromise the credential by compromising the wallet, right? You could get access to the credential, but you're not going to be able to turn around and, you know, so I just want to point that out. But the key is you don't want to actually lock credentials to the device it, it, in, in most cases because people change devices and they're going to, we're going to absolutely, and we are already starting to tackle multi-device wallets. I use, yep. uh, you know, I use um, uh, encrypted messaging apps on all my devices and I can switch between them and I need to be able to do that. We need to be able to do that with wallets. The other part of the, the other leg there is the, is the person, right? You need to be able to authenticate. You need liveness detection and that's getting better and better. They're, you know, most of the solutions on the market are proprietary. But um, again, like you said, Daryl, it's hard, but there are solutions and we're integrating them. Um, uh, everyone's everyone's yeah. been working with MasterCard and integrating and, and we're gonna be rolling that out. So we can start to have really high quality liveness detection and give verifiers the assurance they're looking for. Good. Um, Greg's asked a question about, and I'll, I'll, I'll start with this one. Maybe I mean, you can finish off with it, Drummond is, how do you reconcile centralized governance authority in a decentralized world? Um, I'm going to push back on the premise. There's nothing that's fully decentralized, nothing on the planet. It's a question of where are the decentralization points and are you tolerating them? But let's take a very trivial example. And actually, I just read about this on, on Twitter. Someone shows up with a driver's license in, uh, in Utah. Let's go back down to Utah. I had a really weird experience there, but we'll talk about that. And shows her driver's license and is told, well, I, I don't accept that driver's license without a passport. And the person's looking at their driver's license and wondering what the heck is going on. Turns out the young, or assuming young or just uneducated, ignorant person behind the counter didn't realize New Mexico was part of the United States. <laughs> that system is decentralized. Yeah. It is issue. I am carrying and using my credential that was issued by a centralized authority. Sure, but I'm using it with Hertz because they want to see a proof I'm allowed to drive. They don't need that other than their insurance purposes. There's a whole reasons of why and how they use, they also use credit cards to know that I'm a real person with actually some life behind me too, because that's what they don't necessarily charge it yet because I can pay cash for my rental card, but they'll still ask for a credit card. These worlds are decentralized in their own different ways. When you push into DeFi and, and get into the realm of, more and more and more decentralized, you're still going to end up with something that says, oh, hang on a second here. I'm a resident of Canada. I'm a citizen of Canada. And I just transferred $150,000 USD to someone offshore. Turns out they're a terrorist. That's a totally decentralized transaction. I'm still liable under the law of funding terrorism. So how are you going to jive those two? You, can, you can't separate them. You can go and live on an island, perhaps, and, and you know do some seasteading. They're still going to come down with rules that you have to follow. That's your little centralization bubble. To me, it's how do you force apart the massive centralization that ends up happening when everything is being tracked by a single bank is my institution doing my whole life, and then I move countries and realize that Barclays in the UK is not Barclays in the US, and now I don't exist. That's the centralization points, which are not logical. They're dangerous. Not that that's, you know, I mean, that's a hell of a problem. If I've gone 10 years into the gain world of using Barclays and I move countries, I have now just collapsed my whole digital existence. So it's a question of where are you centralizing and tolerating versus hoping decentralization is going to solve all the problems. It's not. 
it's going to break apart some of the problems and make them much more set. I mean, much more soluble. I've ranted enough. Uh, oh boy. I love uh, Scott uh, Perry's uh, quote in the, uh, in the chat, decentralized equals a million centralized governing authorities linked to the web of trust. Um, I, 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 I Strongly agree with you, Daryl. Anyone who says decentralization means zero centralization, I just don't think that's actually how society works. We're not going to get rid of governments. Uh, you know, we could change the ratio of things, and that's what we're going to be doing. But it's it's a matter of, I mean, people don't refer to this right the way we've been handling our identity for a long time as, oh, this is highly centralized. Yes, the credentials in this wallet are issued by institutions that have developed trust and that's why they work. One thing I like to point out is folks say, oh, well, SSI can't work because you all insist on decentralization. We go, no, you're going to have credentials from trusted authorities. But then they think, oh, well, SSI is just about that. And no, it the whole infrastructure is going to support the new decentralized forms of producing trust, right? That don't have to reply, rely on, on, on uh, centralized institutions. The whole spectrum is going to work if we get the standards right, if we get the infrastructure right. So that's that's what we need to do. I know we're, we're out of time. Yeah, I knew uh, there were going to be way more questions yeah, we can answer, Daryl. There's definitely loads of questions. One of them is really, I think, good maybe maybe to close on which is what do you think about the um, European Commission proposal for revision regarding EIDAS, which really, and to paraphrase, you know, really opens the door to SSI. T to me, I, I think it's amazing. And I'm, we're seeing similar in announcements in the Canadian governments and other governments all, all around. They're recognizing that, that SSI is actually much more aligned with how they've been doing things in the past. They give me a passport that I use. They give me a driver's license that I use. They need to know it's me in order to provide me with services. Quick, quick one. When COVID hit and the Canadian economy collapsed, if you were living in BC or Alberta and applied for federal benefits and had a digital identity, you got your benefits within seconds. It wasn't measured in minutes. It was measured in check this box. We know who you are. See you later. If you didn't and had to work in the physical, it was measured in weeks or months. Governments want to serve their citizens in their own particular way. The SSI world is much more natural and avoids them, as John Jordan says, avoids the temptation of surveillance. Governments don't even want the ability to surveil that you're using your driver's license at a casino to get into a bar or to use it for whatever purpose. They just want to, there, that is used for driving, and you may use it for other purposes. They don't want that information. But yeah, Drum, I need to jump on onto a board meeting. Um, how about you? <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I, 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 it's like we have to do this uh, on almost a regular basis, uh, Daryl, because there's so many good questions and the space is moving so fast. I want to thank everyone who's come yes. together to, you know, to focus on this topic. I want to reinforce, I'll say it again, digital wallets uh, and, and, and the empowerment that they represent for individuals and businesses and devices and the whole you know decentralized uh, digital trust infrastructure they are at the very center so this is critical next week we're, we're everyone's going to be giving a webinar on the you know um the issues at w3c with the did spec being objected yep. to by guess who google apple mozilla only three um <clears throat> why um we're going to get right down to you know questions and issues like that. This is a war for um, you know it's the wallet wars, and yep. boy, we need that to turn out right. Perfect. Well, Drummond, I'd like to thank you for joining me on this. And folks, uh, uh, we'll be sending out an email to everybody, link to this, uh, link to the deck. I'll include as well the trust registry webinar, which is just a month ago. Um, probably about it, I think, for now. Yeah, but thanks, thanks a ton. And if we'll also go through the questions and see if there's fundamentally something we missed. So, yeah, I'm very happy to do it. And uh, we'll, we we keep going. We're, it's it's a journey, and we've we're all, we're still in, the, in, in you know we're at the end of the beginning. How's that? Yep. Awesome. Well, thanks a ton, folks. I'm going to stop the share, and uh, you guys all keep being awesome. You too, Daryl. Thanks very much. Thanks. You bet.